This is Carrie Peters Passing, the DIY Funeral Channel, where you can create amazing celebration of life ceremonies for your loved one. Hi, I'm Carrie. On today's episode, I have brought on Kimbo, who's going to help me go through the steps of what to do when your loved one passes away. There's a lot of information that we're going to go through today. So Kimbo is going to project his thoughts with images so that some of these things are easier to remember. There's two types of death. There is expected death when somebody passes away in a nursing home or a hospital or even at home palliative care. When you face the situation, you're going to want to call the nurse who's in charge who has been taking care of your loved one so that they can come to the bedside and declare the death. If this is an unexpected death, such as a murder, suicide, or sudden infant death syndrome, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to call the police and they will then inform the coroner. Once you've made that initial phone call to either the nurse or the police, you're going to want to inform the rest of your family. It might be you that has to make the very difficult phone call notifying them of your loved one's passing. During this phone call, you'll want to ask them if they would like to come to the bedside before the transfer plate takes place. Many people feel the desire to be involved and take action. What I can suggest to you at this point, you can pick out some clothes and when the nurse, the rest of the family arrives or the funeral home, you have the opportunity to dress your loved one before they begin their journey. You can also assist in placing your family member on the stretcher. Once the transfer has been completed, it would be a good idea for you and your family to get together and have a meeting about what to do next. Some of the things that you're going to want to discuss in this meeting are going to be what type of disposition that would suit your family best. There are two different types of disposition that funeral homes provide. Cremation or a traditional casket burial. If family is coming from far away and they would like to view, it might be advised to have embalming take place so that you have a longer time frame in which they're able to have the best possible viewing experience. If you plan to have a service for your family member, it would be a good idea to discuss where and when you would like the service to take place. Many people are choosing to do alternative services now. The funeral doesn't have to be in a church or at the funeral home. It can be at a restaurant, a hotel, a zoo, museums, even a national park or a farm. You'll want to make sure that the facility that you choose has some sort of shelter in case there's bad weather that day. People don't tend to reschedule funerals. You're going to want to choose an officiant for the service. This can be a clergy person, an MC, a family friend, a celebrant. They will ensure that the service runs smoothly and that there's no uncomfortable awkward breaks or people that don't know what to do or when. Once you have these things figured out, you can begin to draft up the obituary. An obituary is a write-up which families share to notify other people that their loved one has passed away. This is important if you're having a service, but also important if you're not. It helps to avoid those uncomfortable situations when people ask, so how's your dad doing? How's your daughter doing? It notifies the public of what has happened and allows you some peace of mind and a lot of community support. You'll want to set up a meeting with the funeral home and your local funeral director in order to go over some important documents which will allow them to register the death and assist you with any funeral plans that you might want to make. 
Some of the information that you're going to want to bring to the funeral home for the arrangements are going to be the will. This establishes who the executor of this, the estate is. If there isn't any will, the authorized decision maker is often the firstborn or eldest child. You will need the date of birth of your family member who has passed away. You will need their parents' names, including their mother's maiden name and her place of birth. If the deceased was ever married, you will need their first and last name, maiden name, and place of birth. This includes if that spouse has been married, widowed, divorced, or is still surviving. Next, you will need the social insurance number or social security number if you're in the U.S. This can be found in the deceased wallet usually or on their tax forms. You'll want to bring along that obituary that you might have drafted with the rest of your family. You'll want to bring a photo for the funeral home's identification purposes and possibly one for the obituary. If the deceased is going to be buried in another country or as a resident of another country and just visiting, bring in their passport for any further documentation that might need to be taken down. I hope this information today has helped you in the initial planning stages after your loved one has passed away. Thank you so much for watching and thanks to Kimbo for being such a wonderful dog during the filming of this. Like and subscribe for all the videos covering various aspects of funeral service and how you can be more involved. On the next episode of Carrie Peter's Passing, egg salad again? What is this? The 50s? We're going to learn how to make an amazing funeral luncheon on a budget. It's gluten-free, lactose-free, and can be easily modified to make vegan versions. It's much easier to transport than messy egg salad, and all of your guests will be wowed while you still stay within your budget.